All right, so Acts chapter 18, you guys are all there, except I am not. Um, Acts chapter 18, what I want to do is read to you the 17 verses. We're going to be in verses 1 through 17. This is Paul, and he is in the city of Corinth in the city of Corinth, to whom he writes, the church to whom he writes, two letters, and they weren't necessarily his kindest letters. Corinth, so let's see, Acts chapter 18, and we are in verses 1 through 17, you guys, here comes. Okay, so it says here this, after this, Paul left Athens. Remember that this, if you were here on Wednesday last, we talked about Paul being in the city of Athens and ministering. So it says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, uh, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named uh, Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, Paul's second longest stay in a city teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would, have reason, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Ooh, what a story, huh? Tell you what, let's pray. Let's see why the Holy Spirit gives us this story. Lord, thank you so much for this story. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for how this word, Lord, um, it never returns void. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. You are working in each one of us. And we pray, Lord, continue the work. Our hearts are just open to you. Our hearts are yielded to you. Lord, we desire to to learn and to grow in the word and in the things of Christ. We pray, Lord, this evening that you would just anoint our study. Lord, we pray for the ministries going on throughout this campus because there are youth, there are kids who are growing in the things of Christ, all for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you guys. So here in Corinth comes a rabbi Christian apostle named Paul. The problem is Corinth ain't the greatest city for a rabbi Christian apostle to actually be in. Here in Acts chapter 18, here's what we see. The city that is, I mean, boy, if you read and you study about it, you guys would say at least morally it's gross. It is dark and spiritually, of course, it is evil. 
And I think we talked about this either Sunday or Wednesday. I can't remember, but that's exactly the place that God wants to put people who are lights because Christ occupies their hearts. That's why Paul, the rabbi apostle, or the Christian rabbi apostle, um, is here in this city called Corinth. Every time you read, you study about somebody in the Bible going to some place, you put yourself in that position. You put yourself there because the same God who took that person there is the same God who takes you wherever you go. The same power that that person has to go and minister in this darkness is the same power you have to minister in whatever darkness, whatever Corinth, whatever anywhere God puts you in. So yeah, no guy would want to pick Corinth, but actually a Christian kind of would want to pick Corinth. That's the way it works. Let's talk about Corinth for just a little bit. What am, what am I talking about? Okay. Well, the city of Corinth, actually, you know what? We'll have a map up here on the, on the screen so that you can see. You'll notice that it's at the very left side there, that little island looking deal. Um, that is Corinth right at the top. And you notice there's kind of a little land bridge that's called an isthmus. And that's what Paul traveled over to get from Athens to the city of Corinth. Something like 40-ish miles, okay? Something like 40-ish miles. Um, Corinth was said to be larger than Athens, bigger than Athens. In fact, I did read a few who called it as much as 10 times bigger than Athens. I'm more of a guy who's in the five-ish, six-ish times bigger, but that's still pretty substantial in terms of the size of a city. So they say 200,000 native people lived there, 500,000 slaves lived there. So that's that's a lot of slaves. There were a lot of upper class folk in the city of Corinth. And the reason why, actually, it sort of gives it away. You guys put up that other map, the second map, would you please? It's kind of a close up. There we go. See right in the city, there's uh, right in the center, there's Corinth. And you notice that little land bridge, the isthmus. And that joins um, the uh, Ionian Sea and the Aegean Sea. That's where they come up to on both sides. That's what an isthmus is. It's a piece of land that basically comes up to two, to two seas. It's like a land bridge, so to speak. And <laughs> it's funny because Nero in those days actually tried to dig a canal through that. It's about four miles wide, that stretch, and he failed. And here's what happened because of his failure. If you notice where Corinth is, if you look off to the left, that's where Rome would be. You see the boot? That's Italy, right? That's that's Italy. So basically, all commerce, all trade with Rome and the rest of the empire had to go that way. And Corinth was the place that that stuff would have to go through because nobody wanted to head south into the Mediterranean uh, and go around like that. It was too complicated. So here's what, here's what they would do. Um, cargo, as an example, let's say it's coming from Rome. At that time, they would bring ships right on up to that isthmus there where Corinth is. And if the ship was small enough, they would literally drag the ship across that four mile isthmus to get on the other side and it would go off and sail. If the ship was big, if your cargo was uh, pretty extensive, then one ship came to one side, cargo gets unloaded, gets taken to the other side and another ship picks it up. But you can just imagine how much trade and how much commerce went through that city. And that's why it was so populous. That's why you have 500,000 slaves because people, they had some dough, they had money. But that also meant what? Meant you had a lot of different cultures, you had a lot of different religions, you had a lot of different beliefs, you had a lot of different people going through one place. And that's what made Corinth so immoral. There were absolutes, absolutely not. It was all relativism to the worst It was all about what pleasures me is good for me and what pleasures you is good for you. And man, they indulged, right? That was the place where they have the the temple to Venus and 
and uh, they would say that there were at least a thousand temple prostitutes there, although there were more because there were also male prostitutes, and they would descend upon the city and, you know, apply their trade and boy, the people in the city indulge. You had all the sailors, you had all the commerce people, and then you had all of the citizens as well that they would, this was just a part of it. Uh, Corinth would have been one of those places where many, many languages were spoken because of all the different uh, people, the ethnicities, the nationalities that were there. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul actually mentions the manifestation of tongues. That's one other place in Acts as well, but in 1 Corinthians 14, it's possible that the manifestation of tongues happened in Corinth because you have so many different people in so many different languages. Uh, Corinth also uh, was the, um, where the Isthmus games were, like the Olympic type games. So you had a lot of people, you know, in sports and that whole indulgence. You had the sports thing. It was a place of architecture and artwork, just like Athens, right? Philosophers, they would gather there because there were a lot of people that they could kind of show off to, like, look how smart I am and all those things. But have you heard about how Corinth was portrayed? Because it was just like known as the wicked city of the empire. You've you heard about how when there was Greek or Roman theater, for example, they would always portray a Corinthian as a drunk or somebody who was indulging in something immoral. They would call a man as a bad word, you know, you've been Corinthianized if you're just an immoral and bad dude and nobody wants to be with you. You've been Corinthianized. Okay, none of you start using that word, okay? We're not using Corinthianized in this place. But it was pagan religions galore, just like Athens. Um, you get the idea. And how did I start this whole thing? It's not a place that an apostle Christian guy would just want to like hang out in. Except Christians do, because we know that we have a purpose in places like that. All right, so, oh, and what else about what Paul, Paul there in the city of Corinth? In the city of Corinth is where he writes to the Romans from. He actually writes his letter to the Romans right here from Corinth. And I think it's interesting. I was kind of shuffling through Romans uh, yesterday and today. The first three chapters, what are they just all about in Romans? Like immorality, like the worst of sin, right? Like man just saying to God, forget you, we're all into ourselves and a bunch of other stuff. Well, he wrote that from Corinth. So it's not like Paul would have had to imagine, I wonder what really, really terrible sin looks like. I wonder what it looks like when people indulge in themselves and shut God out. <laughs> all, all he would have had to do was open his front door, you know, in the day. And then at night, he would have just pulled the shades back of whatever they call them. And he would have had it. He would have seen it right out there. It's interesting. It adds a little context to Romans, doesn't it? You read Romans and you consider what I just said and you can see, wow, Paul got it firsthand. Paul saw it. He experienced it. You guys, when Christians experience that, it's supposed to set us on fire. It's supposed to turn the bright brighter because we see this and we hurt like the Lord hurts as he sees them. Um, in... In uh, this work that we are about to study, one of the most encouraging parts of it is to know that when a man decides to overcome, this is going to be cool when, when we get to it, when a man decides to overcome his own weaknesses, which is what Paul is going to do here, um, how the Holy Spirit just uses him. I mean, this is the place where the Holy Spirit uses Corinth becomes one of the big churches of the empire. Corinth becomes, I, well, well, one of the significant ones. You would know that it has to be a big one because, do you remember what the first letter that Paul writes and he goes, some of you say, I am of Apollos and I am of Peter and I am of Jesus. You have to be a pretty big church to be able to say there is a group here and a group there and a group there enough that your pastor has to say, yo, cut it out. 
I mean, it was just three or eight or ten of you, so the thinking goes, it wouldn't be considered that significant. So we would call Corinth a big church, a, a significant and influential church. Uh, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9, 10, and 11, look what it says. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now check out verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is what you can write in your own lives as a Christian. You guys, we need to be writing this kind of stuff. We're talking to people, we're sharing the gospel, and we're shining the bright light over their darkness. And we get to say, do you remember when you used to indulge in all of that craziness? Do you remember when you actually chose darkness over the light of Christ? But God. This is, this is I, I hope that you yearn for an experience like that. It goes like this. So he's in Corinth. That was <laughs> verse 1. Verses 2, 3, and 4 now, Priscilla and Aquila enter the scene. And it says there the reason they're in Corinth is because Mr. Emperor Claudius, he decided to push all the Jews out of Rome. And if you have sort of looked into that, there are a couple of different theories as to why. Um... I go with the idea, because they found some things inscribed in stone, the real reason is because Claudius saw the Jews with a lot of infighting. But the infighting they had was a segment of the Jews versus the legalistic or more traditional Jews. You know what that segment of Jews was saying? That the Messiah has come. They were actually claiming that the Old Testament had been fulfilled. His name was Jesus, Jesus the Christ, Christos, although I think he called him Crestus, and they had, to, they had to fix that a little bit when Claudius wrote about this issue. He wrote about Crestus, not Christos, but we know he was the guy. And it's very likely that he couldn't get to a place where, he, well, he didn't want to try to calm him down. He's like, hey, if you guys aren't good, get out of here. And so he pushes all of the Jews, which also meant the Christians who were Jews, out of the city. So they go out. You see how God uses things like that? Because what do you think happened when a bunch of Christians get sent out from one place? Uh, the gospel goes out with them, doesn't it? I think we read something like that in the book of Acts. Something like chapter 6-ish or something. Chapter 6-ish? Uh, something like that. Um, but, uh, but that's what happens. So here in Priscilla and Aquila come onto the scene in Corinth and it tells us that somehow they have a connection with Paul. We don't know how, we just know that they do and they have their commonalities. They love Jesus, he's their savior and Lord. Uh, they are tent makers. They have the same trade. Apparently they hit it off to the point that Priscilla and Aquila say, hey, Paul, why don't you come and live with us? <laughs> that reminds me, I might have told this story a few years ago, but when we first moved to Prescott back in 1979, uh, I think that there was one Indian couple in this community, one other Indian couple, and we didn't know anyone, we didn't know anything, and it was just a few weeks into moving here that we, my family, when I say we, my parents, my sister and I, and we drove down to Phoenix. And somewhere there was a Kmart, right? I mean, who didn't love the blue light specials? So we went to Kmart and we were in Kmart shopping and my mom sees a woman in a sari because my mother has that on as well. And so she just walks up to her, you know, and they start talking the native language and they connect. Lo and behold, those people invite us for dinner and we end up spending the night at their house. Just like that. It's like that. What's our commonality? It's our, you know, our background, our, our ethnicity. But it was just a funny story. It's like, wow, 
How many people would do something like that nowadays? Yikes, it's like get out of here kind of a thing. So Priscilla and Aquila, they connect. They say, come on over. In fact, take a room. You're welcome. You're welcome to live here if you want. So Paul uh, continues in his trade. That is to say, he is a tent maker. And one of the things about Paul that we appreciate, uh, particularly as pastors, I think, is that Paul really went out of his way to make sure that Christ was glorified and that ministry happened first. There was a little bit of conflict, ripples on the sea, so to speak, because there was the accusation that the men at the pulpit were only at the pulpit to make money. And so these men particularly had to be very careful. They would have accusations, and the accusations would take over. They wouldn't you know, listen to the gospel and just all of that craziness. And so Paul... Uh, decided that he would not be any sort of a financial burden or give any hint of, you know, that nobody could come to that conclusion. So he would take up the trade. He would work during the day, in the evenings, or on the Sabbath kind of a thing. He would go and he would minister in the streets. We know every Sabbath, right, on the Saturdays, he'd go to the synagogues. We're going to read that, or <laughs> we're going to look at it. Um, so I, I really appreciate that, but we're also going to see how today that changes. We're going to see how actually what happens to him in Corinth makes it so that no longer does Paul have to be a tent maker. We'll, we'll check that out. But I do. That's, that's a really sweet thing. Christians, we're supposed to go out of our way, right? We want to make sure that nobody can presume anything negative. We want to go out of our way to the best of our ability to make things look righteous to make it so that all eyes and all attention goes to Christ, not to us. And so that's why we see Paul here. He's a tent maker. He's going to do it. What comes next? A couple of other guys now, not Priscilla and Aquila. It says that his old friends, the guys that he was really waiting for, uh, Silas and Timothy, this is verse 5, they come. And remember now that Paul had to flee from, from Berea, he had just gone to Thessalonica and Berea, but he left those two guys there. You remember why? Because Paul loves people and he wants to see people grow in Jesus. And if he's going to be a barrier to that, he's going to get himself out of the way. So Paul takes off, but he says, hey, you guys, Silas, hey, Timothy, would you do this? Let's minister to them. We're here for them. Would you go and disciple them? Would you share the gospel? Would you tell them about Jesus more? Would you tell them how to pray? Would you explain what it means to become a mature man, a mature woman in Christ? Would you go and do that? I'm going to go. I'll go. But I want you two to stay and take care of our brothers and sisters. I appreciate that about Paul and those other guys too. It's what we care about, you guys, is each other. We care about one another's growth in Christ. We care about the maturing we care about being an example. I bet that Paul was an amazing example. I mean, to watch your pastor go for that reason? Hey, you guys, I want to see you grow. And so if I'm here to stop you, I'm out of here. And this is the kind of heart that all Christians are supposed to have for one another. Look, you don't have to be a pastor to have this heart. You have to be a follower of Christ. And I'm looking at a bunch of those. So you do what it takes to make sure that others grow in Christ. So here's Silas and Timothy. They're back. That must have been, you know, so sweet for Paul. I mean, the poor guy. He's just getting driven out of everywhere, and finally his good friends come back. Here's what's really sweet, too, about those guys. You know what? They bring back some good news. This is where Paul finds out that the guys in Thessalonica and the guys in Berea, they have grown. It's like, hey, Paul, you know how you left us there in Berea and the Thessalonians were grown as well? We just want to let you know it wasn't in vain. It wasn't for naught. In fact, they are growing, man. They are becoming examples of what it means to be Christians. So Paul, he's been driven out of everywhere. He's been beaten everywhere. And here comes some of the most awesome news that a Christian should ever receive. Other Christians are growing. 
And you know how happy that makes him. Hey, aren't we studying Thessalonians in, on Sundays? Isn't this where he writes Thessalonians from? I think so. So imagine the news and how it encouraged him. What else? Let's see. So Paul or Silas and Timothy come because they're awesome pastors and they're men who love the church. So they stayed and helped them grow. They brought news. Here's a number three. So the guys in Macedonia, specifically Philippi. Remember, Macedonia is like a region and Philippi would be in there. So the Philippian church, Paul didn't stay a lot of time in Philippi because like everywhere else, he tries, he tries, and somebody wants to kill him. And so out he goes. But the Philippian people, um, they love him, man. This is Paul. And they see all that Paul is doing, and they understand his trade and his, all the work that he does and so on and so on. So what they do is they put a collection together, and they send financial support to Paul through Silas and Timothy. And it is such that Paul can all together vacate making tents and spend his entire time sharing the gospel. Spend his entire time building up other believers, teaching, discipling. That's why, that's why, um, well, there's, that's why it's good. That's why it's good to have those who lead you who don't necessarily have to take up a trade when leading you. Because we have the opportunity then to focus full time on the gospel, on the growing of God's people, on the influence of the church, and, and so on. This is where really that sort of the foundation of that principle comes from. So Paul gets this, this um, financial support, and it tells us, in essence, the way it's worded there, you guys, in verse 5, that he put himself into the work of the ministry full time. In verse 5, depending on your translation, it would make that kind of a thing clear. Really what it means, though, is, man, he became passionate for the ministry. Okay? That's what verse 5 there, in essence, means. Okay, so now moving on in it, verses 6 and 7 and 8, it's time for Paul's opposition. Like, he always gets the opposition. It's time for opposition yet again because all he's doing is being a light on a hill, He's being a pastor. He's being a Christian. He's being somebody who's passionate for the gospel. And what comes, you guys, when that's what you set your life to? Opposition. You can expect it because if I recall right, it is a promise from Jesus himself. They persecuted me. And they're going to persecute you. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised when the trials come. Um, so here, though, that they come in verses 6 and 7 and 8, we're going to see Paul having to react to what's going on, uh, to having to react to what they're doing to him. It says there that he shook out his garments on them, right? Let me, let me just find my place here in chapter 18 and verse 6. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. <laughs> okay. That was, that. I don't know. If I was there, I might have said, hey, Paul, calm down just a little bit, dude. At least in the shaking of the garments. However, however, I know Jesus himself did say in the book of Mark, uh, I'm sorry, in Matthew, he said, if somebody doesn't listen when you're presenting my message, you go ahead and do what? Shake the dust from your feet when you leave their house. Okay, so I, I get it. I just, maybe I wouldn't have done it. I don't know, but that's me. What about your blood on your hands? What about saying that? Well, that's a reference to Ezekiel, the prophet, when Ezekiel was chosen by God to go to the people of God and say, stop your sin. Like, practice righteousness because God loves you, and you're supposed to because you're his chosen people. But then God tells Ezekiel this, if you don't take my message and tell the people, 
and those people die in their sin, in their unrighteousness, he goes, their blood be on your hands. Okay? And uh, so basically what he's telling Ezekiel is, when you have my message, you go tell the message. Don't make an excuse. I've equipped you with it. I've given you the power to go do it. Now go do it. Now we have to be careful because I have heard people use Ezekiel chapter 3 and some of these like, you, you, I can't believe that you didn't share the gospel with that person. Don't you understand now that their blood is on your hands? That's taking it too far. Uh, I don't think Ezekiel 3 would apply to you and me. However, why do you and I have incentive to share the gospel that we've been given, that we have been equipped with and the power? Because it is the Great Commission. Okay? But to say their blood be on your hands, that's taking it too far. I'll tell you why. Because Ezekiel chapter 3, when, when God says, hey, Ezekiel, go do it, he, like, he picks up Mr. Ezekiel and puts him places. Like he's there and he actually sets him there and he actually gives him the words to speak and he goes, okay, now go do it. So, you know, if God ever comes to you and pulls you up by the hair and sets you down in a group of people and says, go share the gospel, if I were you, I wouldn't say no, God. <laughs> I'd say, okay, God, I will, okay? But that's Ezekiel versus the Great Commission. So Paul, he says, okay, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. You're going to face judgment against because you rejected Jesus. You are going to pay the consequences. And that's something that is so serious. I mean, seriously, you know, I, I don't want to minimize what Paul did here. Because to me, considering a man like Paul, I wouldn't doubt if uh, his eyes were watered, if his eyes were welled up. He might have been a little upset, you know, righteous indignation. But I wouldn't be surprised if he was crying at the same time. That's, what, that's kind of the way I see the whole interaction right there when he says your blood be on your heads i am i am innocent we know how much he loved his fellow jews don't we we know that just read romans he loved them he would have done anything for them and here they were actually saying paul get out of here paul your message is craziness you actually think that we the scholars of the old testament wouldn't know that this jesus fellow of yours is the actual messiah get out of here he's not and so that's what would have been just so difficult. How about a little lesson there? Let's take this lesson from there. I encourage you always to share the gospel. And really, you guys should be in a continual state of prayer. You know how sometimes I'll use the metaphor of the door opening, right? Lord, would you open a door there? Would you close that door? That's a, that's a fairly common metaphor we use. Um, it should be sort of a state of prayer as far as a Christian goes just in life. Lord, show me the next door to op that you're going to open and then give me the power to step through it. That's, that's the way I pray. Show me the door, give me the power to step through, okay? When you share the gospel, praise God, good for you, two thumbs up. But I also want to tell you this, you guys, you have to be able to discern when it's time to step back and let the door close. You have to be able to discern. You know, you don't want to cast pearls before swine. You want to be careful because then there comes a point. Where, like I've shared the gospel with people, and I could tell when they ask me a question. And they'll do one of these common questions. How could you believe in a God that, you know, that let um, Hitler kill six million people? How could you let, I mean, how could you believe that a God like that is a loving God? Um, and, and those, are you, perhaps you've um, dealt with the same sort of questions. I, I'm glad. I want to be able to provide an answer to the best of my ability. But there are some times when people will ask me that same question where I can tell they're not asking me to become like enlightened from a scriptural point of view. They want to take me on. They want to take me on in a debate. They want to start asking me stuff, and they're not really there to hear and let their hearts just be, you know, it, th their hearts are malleable and let the, the fingers of the Holy Spirit sort of shape them, you know, and then the gospel comes in and it, 
and it roots and it sprouts and they receive Christ, I just want to encourage you to be in that state of prayer as well. Share the gospel, answer questions, but know when to say, your blood be upon your hands. Probably don't say those words to them. <laughs> be very loving and very kind. You know, Thanks for letting me share with you. If you ever need to pray or you need questions answered, feel free to give me a call. That's the kind of thing that we say, okay? But be discerning. And as soon as you know that there's no fruit here, as soon as you're casting pearl before swine, step away. God, show me the next door. God, give me the power to step through the next door. All right, and don't fight back, okay? Some of you, you're like the scholar debater types and you just want to win. Don't do it, okay? Just step back and let it be. In fact, Paul even wrote to Timothy, look, I've got this on the screen. He says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed. I needed that a few years ago. In the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. It's a spiritual battle, isn't it? It really is. That's why you share the gospel and you leave it all in God's hands. He'll take the devil down, right? He'll do that. Okay, so we're discerning. So what was the idea there? Paul shares like he always does. Unfortunately, I think he was crying. He says, okay, then your, your, blood, your blood be on your own hands. What comes next? Uh, verse 7 is just, it's just <laughs> it's rad. It is so cool. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Now, I want you to know when it says next door, that literally in the Greek means they share a wall. Okay? So it's not like they're two little houses separated side by side. It's more like a strip mall. One here, <laughs> the synagogue here, and the the um, new church right next to it, and that is the house of justice. The hall of justice. Remember that in the Super Friends? <laughs> Eight of you know about that, okay. Um, so the house of justice becomes the first Christian church, you might say, in Corinth, and it happens to be right next door to the synagogue, and talk about some impact. How about verse 8? Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in Jesus along with his whole family. Does the gospel have power? Yes, it does. When a Christian steps up and obeys the Lord in the Great Commission, can amazing things happen? Yes, it can. Right here is an example, you guys. The very ruler of the Jewish synagogue hears the gospel and he goes, I'm in. I can see that this Jesus really is the fulfillment. He is the Messiah prophesied since the beginning of the scriptures. And it says he comes to Christ, his whole family comes to Christ, and we know in verse 8, historically, that's when Christianity like explodes in the city, like blows up. Man, everybody's hearing about Jesus now. It says people getting baptized publicly, do you remember how we started this? Saying it was like the dirtiest, darkest, most immoral city around. And now you've got those very citizens going to some nearby river and going, hallelujah, Jesus, right? They're getting baptized and they're all happy. That's, that's what the Lord can do. You guys, he uses you, he uses me when we share the gospel. And that just sort of goes out. It multiplies. There's a domino effect. Corinth, Corinth got it got wonderfully taken over. Uh, well, hold on, not taken over. I don't want to overstate it. But Christianity had a radical influence on the city. Just a radical one. Okay, so that's what happens there. So what do we know? Paul does his thing. He goes to Corinth because he's there with a heart for Jesus. 
Um, we know that Timothy and si uh, Silas come, and we know that the encouragement that they give to Paul. Paul do, um, goes and shares with the synagogue like he always does. Unfortunately, people say, get out of here like they always do. Paul says, okay, I'll stay faithful and I'll keep on sharing. Lo and behold, the Lord responds to it by letting Christianity begin to explode in that place. All right. So here is where things turn, though. Here's where things turn. I want you to think about it like this. What I've done so far in these first eight, nine verses is sort of we're watching a movie and I'm kind of saying, okay, in this scene, here's what's going on. Now in this scene, here's what you're seeing. And now in that scene, and that's kind of the way I've been explaining it to you. As observers, what about Paul? What about the fact that Paul is just a guy? What about a fellow Christian, a brother, who has had to endure persist, persevere, put on armor because he's getting shot at from every angle. What about the man? And this to me is where it all changes. We go from the outside looking in to the inside looking out. In other words, let us become Paul after considering everything that we have read so far. What we know from these verses that come up next is that Paul was suffering from a crisis. We know that there was something going on that we would call serious. And guys, you're talking serious to the max. What happens here should give us pause. It should humble us. We should go, ah, I can relate. But we need to relate all the way through. I'll explain all that, don't worry. But that's, that's the kind of thing that the Lord allows us to see in what comes up next in these, in, these, in these verses. You guys, look at what it says. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. I want you to be Paul right now. Ready? Here goes. We're Paul. <laughs> We're Paul. Here's, here's life. I go into a new city. And what I do when I go into that new city is I find the synagogue, the place where the people of God are. And I go and I try to show them through their own scriptures that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And after I make that presentation, I offer them their salvation. I just say it is a gift from God, receive it by faith. And praise God that many of them receive my message. But I also have to face an angry crowd that always incites angers from some anger from my Jewish brothers. And that's usually when I get beaten. That's usually when they take sticks or whips or their bare knuckles and they pound me. And sometimes what happens next is the city, the people in the city start to get incited with anger and I have mobs of people running after me and all they have is blood in their, my blood in their eyes. All they want to do is tear me apart. All they want to do really is kill me. And then I go to the next city and I walk in there and I go to the synagogue and I prove to them that Jesus is the Messiah and I offer him as salvation and some of them receive him. But then there's this mob of guys who are my brothers and they take whips and they take sticks and they take me outside and they beat me until it's hard for me to see. And then even sometimes a crowd from the city gets all incited and they run after me and they want to kill me. And so I have to run to the next city. And this happens in Lystra. Lystra is where they drag him out and stone him to death. And it happens in Antioch and in Derbe and in Philippi. Remember, he gets ripped apart with his, with his brother Silas and they get thrown into the jail and all of that happens. And it happens in Thessalonica where he gets run out. It happens in Berea where he gets run out. That's the reason he was in Athens. 
And right now he's in Corinth, and you know what's happening? The movie is replaying. He's gone into a city. He's gone to the synagogue. He's shared that the Messiah is Jesus. He's offered salvation. Some of them have said yes, and others have my blood in their eyes. That's where he is right now. This is verse 10, okay? Verse 9, verse 8, verse 9. That's where it is. What naturally in the mind of a man who has endured that, not once, twice, three times, but five times, what is a man going to think is going to happen next? Everything has happened precisely in order, exactly like Lystra, exactly like Derby, exactly like every other city. Paul's next, because he's just a guy, Paul's next thought is, there is going to be a crowd of men who want to kill me. There will be a crowd in this city where they're going to have sticks or they're going to have rocks. And they're going to chase me until they throw rocks so that the rocks hit my head. And then, then when I fall, they're going to keep on throwing the rocks. And I'm going to die in the city of Corinth, right there on a dirt road. This is, this is what Paul is thinking. He was, he was scared. Paul was fearful. Paul was afraid. And how do I know that? How do you know, know that? Because Jesus, who walks up to him in a vision, the very first words he says is, Son, uh, uh, Paul, do not be afraid. It's, it's a present active tense. It means that he is in the state of fear. Not, Paul, you were scared yesterday. Don't let that happen again. It's your trembling right now. Stop trembling. Do not be afraid. He writes to the Corinthian church. And in his first letter, chapter 2, he says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. He says it straight up. I faced a crisis in my humanity where I actually wanted to stop my ministry. Like I was that close to quitting I was that close to leaving this city, going back to Tarsus, and making tents. That's where I almost was. Verse 10, Jesus had to say, listen, stop being afraid and let me make another promise to you. No one will attack you. Because remember on his mind, if the movie plays like it always does, the next thing that would happen is men would chase him and hurt him. And so the next thing Jesus says is, Paul... No one will attack you to harm you. Again, Paul, I know, five times, Antioch of Pisidia and Lystra and uh, Philippi where you were just ripped apart and stoned in Lystra. I know, Paul. I know that's the way it's been. But now I, I was thinking, Paul, he goes from city to city and he stays the course, right? Every time he stays the course. Um, Paul's not a robot, you know? Paul's like a Raj. He's just a guy. And, and human beings don't like to be threatened, let alone actually beaten, let alone where those who beat you won't stop until they desire, until they, because they want to see you dead. Human beings, we don't respond well. <laughs> To that kind of stuff. We don't respond well to knowing that just our presence in a crowd, somebody from the crowd could at any moment jump and attack. And this was the very life that Paul led. Everybody knew who this dude named Paul was. His reputation preceded him. Everybody knew that there was some little, you know, Jewish guy. They say he was like four foot something or four foot nothing, whatever, the, however it goes, right? But he's really smart, but he comes right at you and he makes these claims. And he's not very, you know, he won't give you any grace or anything. When it comes to his philosophy, his religion, he says it is the only way. And so people already know, man, they're ready for conflict. People already know they're ready to take this guy down. So just his existence as a guy in that area was scary. You know, none of us take well to that. Just think about it. If you walked anywhere and you just thought there could be any moment where somebody knows who I am, 
He's like a celebrity, but in a bad way. Um, that could be really tough. And what we see is Paul being a man, being a human being, a man who's just saying, um, I don't think I can take it anymore. I don't think I'm going to take it anymore. When's the next attack coming? When is the next person going to hide behind a door and smash my skull with a rock? When is that coming up? And for Paul to actually be told by Jesus, don't stop speaking? Do you know what Paul did for a living? What did Paul do? What was his whole life and ministry? It was to speak. He was called by Jesus to go and tell of him to the Gentiles, to the rulers of the world. And we have a moment in time where Paul actually said, I am going to zip my lips once and for all. And that's why Paul, or Jesus even says, go on speaking and don't be silent. So, so far, Jesus has given us the whole insight here, right? Don't be, don't be afraid. He says, Paul, that's it. Don't be afraid. He goes, uh, go on speaking and do not be silent. You are afraid because you think you're going to be dead. You're just like any other man. Don't worry. You want to stop the ministry that I've given to you because the ministry is the reason why you're being persecuted. Don't worry. You guys, that part lands on so many of us. I'm going to quit my ministry because my ministry in some way or some form is giving me trouble. There is something about my ministry that's making life tough. And Jesus has an expectation when he lays ministry in your lap. You know what it is? Don't you quit. The expectation from heaven is if I have given you a task and I have given you the power to do the task, who are you to say no to me? That's the story of the Bible. Praise God. I mean, he does give us a free will. Nevertheless, he's saying to Paul, Paul, I've given you a task. I chose you to be the man who is my messenger to the Gentile world, basically to the whole world. And you're actually going to quit on me? You don't really think of Paul that way, do you? We usually don't read Paul and think that Jesus sort of walked up to him and said, you're going to quit on me? But that's what Jesus is basically saying here. You're going to quit on me? Because, because you're thinking in your humanity that all of this is going to happen and you don't think that I can overcome whatever it is that you're afraid of? We just don't think of Paul and Jesus having an interaction like that. But remember what I said? He's not a robot. He's just a guy. You know, he's not a robot. He's a Raj. I had to put that for me, okay? That was, that was conviction. He's not a robot. He's a Raj. That was, that was personal conviction. And guys, I want you to consider that in your own time, okay? On your own time, you read what happened to Paul. Most amazing ministry, most amazing apostle, most amazing Christian, they say, right? Because of all that came of him. And yet he was going to quit on Jesus, just consider what that means. Challenges come in your ministry. Challenges come in your life. But frankly, God doesn't put up with your excuses. He doesn't put up with mine. He says, because I'm God. That's why. He's not condemning you. He's not condemning me. He's saying, wait a minute. Who are you looking to right now? Are you looking up or are you looking in? If you're going to look in, then forget it. Yeah, go ahead and quit. But Jesus comes along and he says, Ahem, sir, could you be looking in my eyes right now? Could you remember that I am the one who has all of the power? I'm the one who called you. I am the one who will take care of every little detail. That's why he says, do not be afraid. No harm will come to you. Stop being silent. I mean, don't not speak. You talk, man, you blabber. That's one of the great things I love about Jesus is he tells pastors to blabber right here. In case you don't know, it is a commandment from God that we do not stop speaking. So if you ever think I'm talking too long, take it to heaven. Okay, it's not my issue. Okay, <laughs> but look, I want, I want to really, really though hone in on, on to the one emotion in particular that is the danger for every Christian, and that is fear. Okay, let's tackle it because that's what the Lord is teaching us right here. Fear. Here's what fear will do in your life. Fear will cause you to snag control of your life away from God 
so that you yourself can make your decisions with this goal, I gotta get out of here. That's what we do in the flesh. When things become dicey, when things become uncomfortable, if we don't remain faith-filled looking to heaven, we go, I am going that way. I am zipping my lips. I am, and then we do whatever it takes to get us out. And you know what happens? God certainly doesn't get glorified. Satan gets the, vic the in lower case, okay, gets the victory. We don't want to, we don't want to do that. That's why Solomon, he writes Proverbs in Proverbs 29, the beginning, verse 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare. Huh, he's so right. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. But, but, if you, if you allow the Lord to remain in control despite your emotion, things, you, you don't fall into that snare. Um, Paul didn't understand that he was about to quit a year and a half early. He didn't get it. To him, his destiny, it was laid out before him. I'm either out of here or I'm dead. No, actually what Jesus said was, I've got, I've got, I've got people who right now are sleeping with temple prostitutes and they're worshiping idols and they're doing all kinds of terrible stuff. Except I love that person and he's going to be mine soon. But Paul, that's going to happen because you are going to be an obedient disciple of mine because your eyes are going to stay upward, not inward. Did Paul know that at that moment? No. You guys, you don't know what the Lord has for you. Don't think that it's all just laid out before you, okay? This was right around the corner. This was right around the corner. You're talking, how long did this go for? Did this last an hour? I don't know how long this took. How long did it take from that time to that time when Paul said, I quit, to the time that he said, oh, no, 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 I don't quit. I'm in it. Did 45 minutes go by? Did three days go by? I don't know. But a span of time went by. And if Paul wouldn't have allowed, I mean, if he would have stopped on this side of that span, he would have quit. And apparently God would have allowed, uh, can I surmise this, God would have allowed Corinth to just go to hell in a handbasket. And Paul would have been in Tarsus making tents. But, but he says, okay, okay, okay. And he, and, he, and he says, okay, God, you're in this. Okay, God, I'm going to listen to you. Okay, Lord, what now? And then God, he gets his word from God, and he goes off into Corinth for 18 months. And Corinth explodes with Christianity. I said it was a big and significant church. There it is. That's why. Solomon goes on to say it like this. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. That's, that's it. That's where we're supposed to go. So I want to encourage you in Proverbs 29. That's a really cool devo devotional verse. Consider it. Proverbs 25, uh, 29, verse um, 25. Um, one of the notes that I'm, I'm going to put up, I might have gotten put up, but here was one of the things I want to encourage you brothers and sisters as, as we go from here and we talk about this in a practical way. I want you to understand that God will never use fear. God will never use fear in your life. No fear of man, no fear of the enemy, no fear of circumstance. He will never use fear to guide you in your life. So that's a measure. You can actually look at a decision you're making, something you're considering, and you must ask yourself, what is, why am I inclined to this decision? And if your answer comes, because I'm not sure if this might happen. Because if I don't, then, you know, I'm doomed to this. God will never allow fear to lead you in your life of service for the Lord. So another thing to consider, okay? Fear is a very dangerous thing. It can be a snare, or if you trust in the Lord, it means nothing. 
With that said, I want to close. I want to close in this area. By the way, in verses, let me just let me skip ahead. Verses 12 through 17, very simple summary. Like seriously, on my screen, it's half a screen. And that's just this, that the Jewish leaders did what they always do. They went after Paul. In this case, they drive him before the governor and they say, Governor, this guy, he is inciting all kinds of rebellion because he's teaching illegally. Because the Roman government had to okay your religion before you were allowed to teach it. The Jews were okay. So these Jews go, he has nothing to do with Judaism. He's teaching this crazy stuff. You ought to prosecute him. And the cool thing was this Gallio, by the way, historically, he's called a very wise ruler. It's interesting. He's got a cool history written to him. Um, he understands it. He goes, you guys, get out of here. Do you think I'm a fool? And he basically says, uh, that's enough. He rebukes the Jews and he sends them out. It says he sends them out like, get out of my face. And the Greeks get mad uh, at Sosthenes who brought the whole charge against Paul, and so they beat Sosthenes. See? You let God take care of it, all right? Vengeance is his, saith the Lord. And so that's what happened there. So that's my summary of those verses, okay? So I'm going to close with these verses that I want you, please, to consider for meditation. The idea, again, this is where we were going to. All this great stuff happened in the life of Paul. Then we looked at Paul the man. And we realize that there was a crisis inside. It's reality. And so what I want us to do is appreciate and thank God for letting us see this. But then we've got to learn from it. What did we learn? Faith, by keeping your eyes up, not in. Right? Number two, fear is a dangerous emotion. Because when we respond to fear, we are always inclined to take control and make decisions that get us out. And we are where we are because the Lord wants us there. So that's, that was number two. Number three, Paul allowed the influence of Jesus to change his mind, not the influence of fear to change his mind. Where do you and I get the influence of Jesus right now? Do we wait for a vision to pop up? No, we have the word of God right here. When you and I face a crisis, whether it's fear or any other, here is what you must do. You must be locked in, in prayer and by leading of the Spirit. Be locked into the Word. Allow the Lord just to minister to you in whatever you read. I know sometimes we pray and we say, Lord, would you just put my finger on the verse that matters today? You know, I, uh, look, I confess, I do that sometimes too. But for the most part, the Holy Spirit will lead me to a section of Scripture. For the most part, I might, I might Google something. You know, I'm feeling depressed today. Show me a proverb about depression. And I'll go to it and I'll just say, Lord, I've been taken to this verse today. Would you please, please speak to me so that I will listen and I will obey. That's what Paul did. So what happens? You have to go to the Lord and listen to his word empowered by his spirit. Okay, then what is the final thing? Make the bold step. You have to be able to overcome the flesh, you guys. Make the bold step. You think Paul knew that he was going to stay a year and a half in this city? No way. Corinth, the yuckiest city in the empire? And it was going to be the place where he stayed second longest. By the way, Ephesus was number one. It's going to be on his third missionary journey. He's going to be in Ephesus for three years. But Corinth, you'd have, who'd have thought? You guys, let the Lord lead you, and you'll get a bunch of these. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? God will use you to do some really, really sweet things, okay? All right. I said I was going to give you these verses. Here they come. Uh, number one, Romans chapter 8. Okay, this is a lot of reading, but let's read it. You just look at the screen. I'll read it out loud. Romans chapter 8, some of the coolest verses ever. In fact, I think Lewis might have even mentioned one of these when he started um, worship today. But check this out. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, there's the question that you should have a highlight on. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Can you just see Jesus and Paul right there? 
Hey, Paul, hey, I got you covered, man. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Oh, thank Jesus for that. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. It's like he went down this list. He ransacks this list of all possibilities of something that can separate him from God. And he goes, I went through the list and I went through right on to page end and I couldn't find a single thing that could separate God from me. He goes, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come. See how he's going through that little list. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I tell you when Paul wrote that? In Corinth. He wrote that from the city where he had this vision because he was going to quit. Because he was more afraid of men rather than being confident in God. And he gets this vision and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. No one, no one can separate me from my God. No one can separate his will from mine when I look up. So I'm going for it. So he writes Romans 8, 31 through 39. Okay, two more, uh, three more verses. Ready? Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's just a big amen right there. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. When we yield to fear, we know instantly it is not a God thing. He even writes to... to um, he writes that to Timothy. I think it's really cool because we think of Timothy as being the guy. For God, hey, Timmy, come on, little Timmy, listen. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. Do you understand that Paul writes this uh, out of what's called a gnosko, out of a knowledge that comes from a personal experience? It's not because he hears that Timothy is scared and he goes, listen, little Sonny, don't be scared anymore. He does hear that Timmy is scared, but he goes, son, Trust me, I know. Don't be, don't be afraid because I know that God didn't give you that spirit because Jesus himself told me. Final one, and then we're done. John chapter 10, this is our Savior Jesus, our sheep, uh, I mean our shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to smack, snatch them out of uh, the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Here's what got me on this, okay? I heard this from another pastor. I'd never thought about it this way. He goes, do you understand what Jesus is saying right there? He goes, two-thirds of the Trinity are one just for the sake of keeping you. I had to, I had to like think that one through, and it's like, you're right, two-thirds are one and one of the reasons two-thirds are one is to make sure that nobody ever takes them out of their hands. And then the one-third of the Trinity, so to speak, um, resides inside of me and seals me. So three-thirds of God, <laughs> all of him, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, part of one of their most important ministries is to keep you tight. That's just the sweetest thought, isn't it? You guys, this is who um, Paul got to see in a vision. That's who, that's who Paul got to have his fear overcome by was God himself. And because of what happened, God used a man who was about to quit to transform the dirtiest, dark, darkest, yuckiest city in the empire to become one of the biggest and most influential churches um, anywhere. Okay, that's you. That's you. Don't underestimate yourself. If you're struggling with something in your life right now, whether it's fear, whether it's sin, temptation, whether whatever it might be, put yourself right there, okay? Take it to the Lord. Go to his word. 
you are controlled by the Spirit of God, and then be bold. Make the step, and God will use you for great things. All right, let's pray.